as follows. So it's Andalou from Turkey, the Birmingham Jaguars from England, uh, Budapest from Hungary, the Chisinau Scorpions from Moldova, Copenhagen in Denmark, the Dublin Blues from the Republic of Ireland, Edinburgh Eagles from Scotland, Leone Veneti from Italy, uh, everyone's favourite, the Mad Squirrels, Vraklabi from the Czech Republic, uh, North Brussels Gorillas from Belgium, the Rhodes Knights of Greece, Ronda Outlaws of Wales, the Rotterdam Pitbulls of the Netherlands, Skane Stags of Sweden and uh, the aforementioned Stavanger of Norway, and finally the Valencia Hurricanes of Spain. Yeah, and the Euro 13s have announced a new commercial partnership with HQBS Energy as well, so they're starting to get sponsors on board, which maybe helps address some of the lingering questions, one of which is, how's this being funded? Is there yes. going to be any, Is it all self-funded by the clubs, or is there going to be some sort of commercial and broadcast partners putting something into this competition that can at the very least provide some sort of prize money or, or you know some something that can make the incentive of playing in this competition become more long term yes yeah they're, they're still um they are steadily releasing news um but yeah it's still a keep a watching brief on it it sounds interesting but let's see if they're uh, you know the cut of their jib actually uh, lives up to what they hope it will be it's staying in the news cycle isn't it well, it's something we can talk about. It's something where there is the very um, clear in their messaging. It's very kind of we're announcing the teams, then we're going to talk about sponsorship. Um, I saw something today about refereeing. Um, you know, sponsors they talk about TV deals, although obviously nothing's kind of got across the, the line yet. The, things are positive in one way, but on the surface, it's just it'd be interesting to know what's going on. Yeah, officiating um, and the structure around that is still one of the big things to be fully resolved. Yes. Um, the other thing I think that's to be fully understood is this player draft. Yes, I, I, I don't understand what. I understand it in theory because I, I listened to a. a, a other podcast about it and they they did explain it and but i don't know ultimately what the teams gain from having these drafted players what do the players gain because these players aren't being paid by anyone it's an amateur competition i mean the, the way that it was explained was that these are players who've fallen through the cracks who are not quite you know for whatever reason it hasn't worked out for them at kind of established um clubs obviously pr- primarily in the UK and it's an opportunity to gain experience at this level but, but are the, they the question... going to self-fund say say I don't know John Jones who used to play for the South Wales Scorpions and then didn't move the few miles west to go and play for the West Wales Raiders and couldn't get a gig at Gloucestershire or goals because they're just a college team again now or what have you I don't know that's an example of a player maybe who could have been looking promising, had a couple of caps for Wales, and then now was, his career's taken a setback. This is a new platform for that guy. So Moldova draft him. Turkey draft him. Czech Republic draft him. What have what have you? How's he gonna get to all the, the to those places for their games? That's the thing that's unclear, isn't it? We don't know where these games are playing. We've been played. We don't know if they're going to be in central venues. We don't know, you know, and that the financial implications around the draft is the one thing that I have the most question marks over. Um, but like we say, they're staying in the news cycle, and it is something interesting to follow and exciting, you know, in in lots of ways to look forward to. Just, just still confusing in lots of other ways. <laughs> Yes. Uh, Kafili College, Coleg E. Ki, Cole, Coleg E. Kimode. Ki, I don't know. Something Welsh. Yeah, we need someone like um, we need like the uh, the Brit Renegade um, or someone to come and tell us how to pronounce that. And um, has become the official academy partner of Wales Rugby League. The partnership, which will be known as the Wales Rugby League National Development Academy, is. 
the only rugby league, um, rugby football league officially accredited dual academy in Wales. The partners are committed to producing the next generation of male and female rugby league players with a potential pathway to Super League and International Rugby League. RFL Education Manager Adam Hughes also confirmed that the academy will be open to everyone aged 16 to 19, including male and female players. So more pathways development in Wales for Rugby League, which has got to be seen as a positive. Absolutely. Um, And the last regular story, so the Rugby League World Cup 2021 have announced Cube Partnership as their official merchandise partner for the tournament, uh, set to take place in the UK next year. Uh, Cube Partnership is an expert sports retail licensing and merchandise business with considerable experience in creating exceptional retail, this is their words probably, uh, and merchandise experience, merchandise experiences for sports fans. I like that term. We, We can sell you some stuff. Um, for sports fans at some of the world's most prestigious events. Uh, working in collaboration with the Rugby World Cup 2021, Cube will operate bespoke official merchandise stores at each of the 61 matches across the male, um, male female and wheelchair tournaments. So Cube Partnership worked on the Cricket World Cup last year. Yes. Yes, uh, I, 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 I had a quick look on their website um, when, when I saw this in the rundown, just to understand who they are. So. I couldn't dig up any dirt on them um, <laughs> from what I saw of, of this company. I don't... They, their considerable experience, their website seems to suggest it's working with the America's Cup and working with the ICC um, in, in terms of global events so far, but I, I'm guessing they've built up a portfolio of minor events to to get to that stage but if we're getting into bed with people that were in that dealt with the cricket world cup last year which was seen as a success across the board then that and they'll have learned about how to do how to operate at that size of event in this country yes so so to me there's there's a, there's a positive there that this this company have been the people picked out to help yeah we will we'll see what the proof of the pudding is. Did you turn up any dirt on them? No, no, I I didn't find out much more than you did. No. So we, we we we'll we'll see what the quality of the um of it is and how it kind of price points and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, a couple of Monday news stories. Canberra have confirmed the signing of young Wigan second rower Harry Rushton on a three year deal starting in twenty twenty one. So I don't know if this is a a thing to be scared of that they're taking players that haven't played in the Super League now. <laughs> um, they're coming for the mall. <laughs> yeah, but Harry Rushton's a kid that had a real growth spur in the last year and a half, and he looks in the mould of the kind of second rowers that are really successful under the six again rule. You know, you're people that you'd not noticed until this year. People like, um, is it Sean Lane? At, yeah. At the, at the Eels and obviously uh, Madison on the other side to him um, maybe not quite as physically imposing as, as, as Willie Kickow but you know that tall rangy athletic um, kind of elbows and knees kind of back row forward that <laughs> yeah. has got has, seems to be quite good in the in the new six again world so yeah, well, if they can develop his potential from the starting point is that then it's it's, it's got to be good for British Rugby League if if not for the Super League unfortunately yep. and Leeds Rhinos utility man Liam Sutcliffe has formally handed a transfer request in to leave the club but is adamant he will remain committed to the Rhinos until the end until the request is resolved Sutcliffe still have a year, has a year to go on his current Leeds deal but now looks set to leave Headingley early and has been linked in a move to Castleford rumours Rumours that started this all were about a move to Castleford. What do you make of of this? Um, where does Liam Sutcliffe play? What? Who is he? What? What does he do? These these are all questions that I don't feel have been fully answered by his career so far. Um, do you think that's why he wants to make a move? You know, he's had enough opportunity at, at Headingley too become established in one position and, and hasn't done so so maybe a change of scenery moving to another club where they might have a plan for him as he arrives rather than fitting him into what they already have maybe maybe, maybe Daryl's seen you know in his, in his you know 
4D models of, of attacking structures. Maybe he's seen something in uh, in in Liam. So we'll, we will see. What do you think his best position is? I have no idea. What do you think his position he wants to play the most is? I think he wants to be a six come thirteen. I think he wants to be a six because I don't think he likes the forward play as much. But I think his best position has has shown to be centre most consistently. <laughs> and this is why we, this is why he's got a problem. Yeah, and hopefully a new a new move resolves it for him because he's certainly got a billy. Yeah, but yeah, as you said, it, it, it's the uh, it's the um, peachy problem, isn't it? From uh, from in the NRL, you know what I mean? Yeah, great great player, but where do you play him? Good point. Um, let's move on to this week in coronavirus and a story we missed last Monday because it kind of came out later than when the show started. So uh, it's so the RFL have confirmed that the reserve league will remain suspended for 2021. So the statement said the board agreed that the RFL reserves league will be suspended for 2021. However, clubs may arrange friendlies. Uh, the suspension will be lifted ahead of 2022. Uh, the academy competition will be extended to under 19s next year to allow a more sustainable one team structure below first team with the temporary res- suspension and reserves. Um, academy will, will be realigned to under 18s for 2022 uh, with the resumption of the reserves. <laughs> It never started, so you can't really say it's resuming. Uh, the scholarship competition will be extended to under 17s for 2021 only. It's like there's a there's a plan, so and it's been announced early. Yeah, which is fair enough. So it can kind of be worked into everyone's retention plans, everyone's structures below the first team level as well. And it's obviously a consequence of the coronavirus, so that's why it's yeah. in this section of the news. On the yeah. 7th of July, 4020 News reported the RFL has sent out a warning to Super League clubs and players to be on their best behaviour following social distancing rules uh, and or risk serious damage to the sport. The Super League season is set to resume on August the 2nd with a triple header of matches played before clo- played behind closed doors. The RFL has emailed the 12 clubs to reinforce the importance of their staff and players following the social distancing rules and guidelines while admitting they already have examples of individuals not doing so and sanctions could follow in the future if these instances continue. The governing body has also suggested a code of conduct that all clubs and their employees could sign up to and follow. Interesting. Do we think because rugby league isn't so high profile as it is in Sydney, probably things like rumours of clubs from certain West Yorkshire sides having garden parties um, before we were allowed to have those sorts of things, or players from multiple clubs reportedly breaking some of the social distancing rules against training and one example that we have pretty much categorically seen was Zach Hardacre and Jackson Hastings training together um, when we're not sure they should have been really under the rules <laughs> at that time um, and we have had reports of other people but less of them putting their own videos of it on Instagram I think but because we're not so high profile those things haven't hit the headline but when we'll be actually closer to the front end of the sports news cycle by having games back in action and seeing people at venues and stuff like that it becomes a little bit more high profile doesn't it because Sky Sports might care about it when they don't have to talk about football well they don't have football to talk about constantly yeah probably I mean it, it's also probably complicated by the fact that they're on fur though and it's like well what rights do you have to say about what they do other than if they're individual you know citizens um I guess we'll just have to be very careful with if, if kids make debuts because it appears if you make your debut, um, you just break the rules instantaneously. That's that's the lesson we've learned from the NRL this weekend. So I think that's, uh, the, that's the thing here, though. When the when these sort of things were happening in the NRL, it was big news, wasn't it? And talked about, yeah. you know, some players get got bans for it and or punishments for it. And I think the RFL are kind of getting out ahead of that stage by saying, right now's the time to buckle down 
yes. here's some things we want you to follow because then if they don't follow them that's when they can start handing out punishments without any sort of challenge without any sort of cause of unfairness and you know it's hard enough to follow the rules when we don't really understand what the rules are when we've got 